Okay, um, so I guess we're ready to get started. Um, and then just for, for anyone who wasn't on the Momentum webinars, uh, please remember that webinar one was a prerequisite um, for for attending these advanced series. So if, you, if you're finding yourself like confused or something, if you didn't watch webinar one, we encourage you after this session to definitely watch it because it'll, it'll really help you as you participate in other ones. And with that, I will pass it on to Paul and Carlos. Okay, thank you, Belle. Okay, hello everybody. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, Paul and I are very excited to have all of you in this second edition our Momentum webinar series, which we're considered as to be advanced trainings. Um, and uh, I'll get started. You want to say hi, Paul, before I rock and roll? Hello, everybody. Thank you, Paul. That's Paul, a standard messaging to everybody. Uh, so, team, let's get started. So, I just want to do a quick review, or actually what we did in the first webinar series. As Belinda said, uh, um, there was a prerequisite, I don't know if that's how you say it in English, but of seeing the first webinar, which was an introduction to momentum and structure. Uh, but if you haven't seen the other ones, uh, you should also check out the two, which is a theory of integration, which is uh, our main claim that we need to integrate momentum and structure. So we uh, talk about, well, what are the main things that need to happen for there to be an integration? Then we said, okay, well, if integration is the main thing that should happen, and this is how you do it, and what are the best practices, the best models, even us knowing that there's plenty, but we just wanted to put them all in one place. And then at the end, we identify common problems so, uh, and, you know, talk about, well, how, you know, how does the model get into problems? How do we get the model out of problems, et cetera, et cetera. So that's been the webinar series. Now, throughout the last month, which we, which I had a lot of people join us in, and you know, the first training, the first webinar has already more than 100, 200 people that had watched. We're very excited that the response that people have received. We have also have heard from people that there are some topics that people really want to hear more deeply about or that there's more confusion about or that people want to have a, a longer conversation. And this is where this series comes. So the one that we're doing today, May 20th, is about framing the movement successfully. And we're going to get to talk all about it. What does it mean to frame the movement? How does it even get framed from the beginning? What are our understandings of victory and all the good stuff? Next week, we're going to talk about team structures. What are the teams... Uh, that need to be uh, work within the spectrum of a movement when there's a lots of amounts of decentralization. So we're going to get to get more deeper into this. How do you build and how do you sustain them? The difference between having tons of autonomy for teams, right? But also a lot of unity strategically. And then on the last one, which will be June 3rd, we're going to talk about actions and tactics. So all the kinds of actions, all the kinds of tactics that are involved in creating uh, the movement of the moments of the whirlwind that we talked about. So let's get started. Again, this is a quick other review of our uh, three elements of theory that are here. You know, the active popular support that we said that is what every movement is after. Really looking to activate masses amount of people or the population of a country or a nation or a state to really come out to the streets and really be active through multiple actions, which what we call escalation of either non-cooperation, marches, boycotts, the whole nine yards. But then also that the last part is that there is an absorption process so that new people that are coming into the movement for the first time can get absorbed into the movement organization and do more escalation and absorption, escalation, absorption, escalation, which is what creates moments of the world when of high moments of tension that we think that uh, really could change society. So that's it. So let's get started. Well, rock and roll, brother. So I just want to tell you that this webinar in particular, I have the most amount of questions about. And a lot of times we talk about this as symbolic demands versus instrumental, and I'll talk to you more about this. But really what this is about for me is trying to give you a little of my experience of depression <laughs> that I've experienced in movement uh, because we didn't have a sense of what victory was. So our movements would get in these cycles of really being in lots of conflict about what was victorious and also feeling really depressed because after actions we felt so deflated. So this is really a, a lesson about how movements can look at victories. And it's really important, and it's really important because it's coming. <laughs> oh, you 
frozen, Paul? Or just... I'm frozen? No. Next slide. It's it's for some reason it's here on my computer, but it's not showing here. Okay. Oh, right there. So why is victory important? Uh, and I think we all intuitively understand this. Even in a sports game, you know, is sports really important? Well, it becomes important because it's theater. You know, it's this it's this real game that people fight for, and and uh, nothing puts fannies in the seats like winning. Um, with and um, everyone wants to root for the winning team. We see this all the time in sports, right? People want their team to win, and they really don't want to root for a losing team. And uh, this can also be applied to politics. Uh, there was a political analyst that said, nothing succeeds like success, that people who are perceived as successful and as succeeding uh, will generally generate more power and more success. James Carville and some other um, political campaigners said that when you win a political campaign, all of a sudden your social capital goes through the roof, and, and if you win, everything you did was right. Everyone who's looking at it, public and the media and other people, think that you did was right. If you lose, everything you did was wrong. That's not really the truth, but that's the way people perceive it. So these are all intuitive quotes from different people that sort of give us an understanding that ha having a sense of victory, of winning, is so important. So if we're going to break that down, what does that look like? Perfect. So Victor is an important theme, I think, because of two things. One, let's say just the press and the public. And I think that in order for the movement to get publicity on the first place, the movement needs to have some sort of credibility, or the cause needs to have some sort of credibility with the public, that it's speaking to the public, the public recognizes it, that the public can trust, that the public can uh, really see that the movement is advancing. And I think, as Paul said, nobody really wants to be hanging out with the people that are losing, which is kind of sad to think about it, but that's how the press and the public sees it, you know? The other side, which is terribly even very important, I don't know if it's more or less, but I think it's super duper important, is the participants, and it's all of us in the movement, right? And I think Victor is really important there because it has to create a sense of purpose that the movement is actually advancing, you know? And that the actions, the sacrifices that people are taking, that they're actually worth it. And it has to build a sense of legitimacy of power because actually most people actually in the beginning stages and sometimes even in the middle stages of the movement, people get really disencouraged when the movement is not winning. And they, it's, it's, there's this battle internally within the movement to believe are we winning or are we losing. And it is so hard to organize when the movement takes so many years and so many struggles to be able to kind of like feel that you're progressing and moving forward. You know, there, I remember there was a psychologist that used to say, like, happiness equals progress. And I think that's the same thing in movement. You know, like, <laughs> movement happiness means movement victory. We have to be progressing. We have to be moving, you know? Uh, so that's just, I think, what we think is uh, the two important things. Rock and roll, brother. Well, but the, the thing is, and you know this if you're in movement, is that the action Actually, what is victorious, what is victory, and what is winning this is not a political campaign where you know very concretely if a politician wins a percent of the vote, they win and they get power. But in movement, most of the time, until the very end, it's not super clear. And actually, when people look at it, they have very different perceptions of what success very subjective. And we're going to go over that. But uh, So how do we control this perception of the movement with the press, the public, and the participants if it's subjective? So this part here, team, really has to be, well, how do we, what are the measurements, essentially, for success on the hybrid model, which is the model that we've been talking on on the first series of the webinars, right? And we think there's two ways. The first one is polarization, which pretty much means 
how much public support are we actually getting? And sometimes this could be done through polling, uh, through really seeing the numbers of public support, you know, uh, how many people are supporting our cause, and sometimes we don't have to say how many people are supporting, how many people are against our cause, and what do people think about it. But that's one way to measure success. The second way uh, that we think it's really important to measure success is organizational development, meaning is the capacity of the movement increasing? Are we getting more people? Are we doing better campaigns? Uh, are we getting more resources, more money, more support, other organizational support us, et cetera, et cetera. Are we growing in capacity? So now let's go through each one of those. So the first one, and Paul, maybe you can rock and roll in this one, but it's a spectrum of support. So when we say the spectrum of support, uh, we've talked about this a lot in our webinar two and our webinar one, which is the cornerstone theory of change for the hybrid model is this belief that if you get a critical mass of active public support, and it's not just getting a passive support, it means active support. We need, and, and Erica Chenoweth, who studied hundreds and hundreds of movements all across the globe and created this database of analyzing why movements win and why movements don't. She really believes that active public support has to reach this level of what she calls 3.5 percent of the population in sustained participation, which in the United States of America is 11 million people that are continually doing things, persuading other people, marching, doing actions, voting with the movement, and whatnot. But to get that, you don't just need to get the active popular support of 3.5. To get that, you generally need a passive support from a majority of people. And the way you do that is you have to polarize the public towards your direction. You have to get a lot of the public to, um, to become supportive of you, and you have to absorb the most active people into your movement. And this is the way, maybe, Paul, you want to go through the civil rights movement example. So as you see in the beginning of the civil rights movement, this is, there's, we divided uh, the the spectrum of support into different categories. And as the movement did these moments of the world in actions, they polarized the public. And they won when they, as you could see, they expanded the active allies. Um, and they, they moved a lot of people into the movement camp, the movement became bigger, and into active allies. And at that point, all the politicians to win at the federal level to, at the local level, to win elections, they had to support the civil rights movement. Um, so, as you see, this is what polarization looks like. We have to do this. And you can measure this, actually. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it, this is actually very common within polling. It, it, sometimes it's called micro-polling, but Frank Luntz, who is the leading uh, framer, uh, marketing expert, PR uh, expert on the right, he doesn't just pull the muddled middle or the swing voters. He pulls um, the base of the movement, the base of the opposition, and the public in the middle. And he really tries to say it's not just about winning a majority passively to your side, but it's about growing your base and energizing your base, um, getting passive support and moving everyone towards your movement. Thank you, Paul. And Tim, another way that we wanted to uh, measure this piece, and let me see, up, up, first, is now the other sector that we were talking about, which is the organizational capacity. And we talked about the ladder of engagement uh, in webinar three, or two, I think, or maybe in both, which is about how do you take your activists and your leaders uh, through deeper engagement as the ladder goes. So the organizational development we feel needs to be measured in the same way. So for example, the first thing is in the online action, right? So how many people are on our list? How many people are signing up our petitions? How many people have donated? How many people online have taken some sort of action which we see as the lowest bar of action, right? But if you can have a hundred thousand people on the online list, oh my God, your movement is progressing. You can do some crazy stuff because you can ask those people to do a lot of stuff, you know? 
uh, you can ask them then to do number two, which is to take action, right? And then I think then real the measurement is quite simple. How many people have taken action? How many people have we been able to turn out to rallies, to demonstrations, to meetings? And then all those people that you're turning to that, then the question becomes, well, how many people have we trained? What's been the mass training mechanism that we have had? How many trainers do we have? Like if tomorrow, like I want you to really picture this, if tomorrow you're in your office, your house, whatever you work and you organize with in your coffee shop, and you have 20 people outside of the door knocking on your door saying, hey, we want to join your movement because we saw it in the TV and it's so cool, would you have the capacity to train them at that moment? What if it was 200 people? So it's very big, quite, but if you do have the capacity, your movement is surely progressing. And then the last one is about team formation and volunteer organizers, which means pretty simple. How many teams are we forming? Are we just one team? Are we five teams? Are we six teams across the country? Ten teams, you know? And how many volunteer organizers do we have? How many people do we have that are organizer in some sort of fashion within the struggle? So that's just another way to provide measurement. Paul? So we're going to go over this again and again and again and again. So if I ever ask anybody, what are the real metrics? How do we measure success and victory? There's two answers always, which is, did that action create organizational capacity and development, and did it create polarization? And really, those are the two factors. Not anything else. Those are the real factors. If you want to go into a movement, any movement across the globe, and you want to say, and you want to analyze whether or not the Egyptians' action um, in Main Square was effective or not for their movement, you can use this metric. This is the metric that, that, that a lot of social movement leaders throughout history have used to analyze and measure the basic criteria of each action and how successful it is. Okay? Now, I want to tell you, we're going to get into it, but that is not how most people, the public, the media, or anybody sees stuff. So we're going to go over it again and again, but in the hybrid model, which is the theory of how social movements in the United States and all across the globe have created social change, um, and, and that theory is does apply to pretty much all populist movements in the United States and across the globe, those are the metrics at which you can understand whether or not the movement is going forward. Thank you, Paul. So, Tim, before we go and ask you, because now we want to open it up and get some of your thoughts and experiences on this, um, I was lucky to be part of a campaign at the end of 2010 uh, with other dreamers across the country that we literally went off to Congress, hundreds of us, and did all this action and then all this uh, activity to engage Congress and push for a vote on the DREAM Act. And I remember when we started the campaign, we said that our main objective was to win the DREAM Act. But internally, the organizers, some of us knew that it really didn't matter if we didn't win. I mean, it mattered hugely. We wanted to win. But what we actually wanted to do was to force Congress to take a vote and really force to see which, who were the people with us, who were the people against us. Uh, but most people that we mobilized were coming because they wanted the DREAM Act to win, which is what we wanted too. Uh, but we did not understand any of the concepts that we're talking about today. And we had we spent around 45 days, there was 300 of us there continuously. There was about 150 people staying in houses all across the sea. Hundreds of people, we have tons of momentum, people coming out of the woodwork. Hundreds of thousands of calls produced to Congress. I mean, the day of the vote, uh, Univision passed uh, or showed the vote in a special Saturday morning. Millions of Latinos saw it all across the country. I mean, it was humongous and uh, really was big defining. The sad part is we won the House vote first, which was good, was good. But then five days later, we had the Senate vote. And as you can see here on the bottom, we lost by five votes. Uh, five Democrats and five Republicans both voted against this. And then everybody in the movement uh, was sad about this because, of course, first we lost. But um, what really happened, I think, at the end of the day was really hard for us to get back on our feet. It took us actually a couple of months to reinterpret and really talk from how do we get from loss to victory and resilience to get people back together. But sometimes I feel what would have been the difference if we would have said from the beginning, our point is to force Congress to do a vote. 
And if they, even if we lost, we would have said, we actually won because we forced Congress for a vote, but we did not know, do that. We actually won with the intention of winning the DREAM Act, and that's how we created an objective, which you will see at the end how this is going to make more sense. But for me, it was super hard. I mean, it was three days before Christmas. You know, everybody was depressed. I was depressed myself. We didn't know what to do. People got deflated. We're never going to win again. The Republicans were going to take over Congress. I mean, it was super depressing times, you know? And I guess the question that we want to ask some of you, and if anybody wants to share, is have you experienced any moment like that, a moment of failure within your campaign, your movement, your struggle? Uh, or have you experienced a moment where it really wasn't clear whether you succeeded or failed, or you had both? I want to ask a question to Carla. Carla. Based yes. on the, the metrics, the measurements that we were talking about with the hybrid model, what was the lame deck session and the effort past the federal legislation in 2010 and all the actions you did around that? Yeah. Was it, based on those metrics, was it successful? I would say no, because I think our metrics was to, I think actually it was yes and no. Because I think the core leadership, the most involved organizers, knew that if we just pressure for a vote, we were going to be successful because we were bringing our issue to the top front. Uh, but I think to the public and our, most of our supporters and new activists, they saw it as a failure. So it demobilized us a lot. And, but I would say this. There was other people that didn't even understand what the heck was the vote <laughs> or the thing. They just saw it on TV. And they said, oh, my God, that is the coolest thing. And then we had all this new upgrade of supporters. So it was like multiple levels of unclarity. Did you win polarization of the public towards your cause? Yes. Did you win an uh, increase in the movement's capacity? Yes. Well, actually, yeah, yes. Very much. <laughs> By how much? By how, could you, do you have a, a real sense of, of those two things? Yes. I mean, we definitely went to at least 50 to 60 percent of support after that. We didn't know when well, the numbers came later. The, the, they didn't even know. We, they, we didn't even measure public done, opinion. Yes. But if anybody would have done polling, they would have realized that that lame duck, the, the duck session was one of the most influential historical moments in the immigrant rights movement. Those 30 days changed public opinion yes. for a huge section of the American population. But their movement, Carlos's movement, wasn't measuring that. That's right. So they were really depressed. Right. Even though their action was incredibly successful at gaining popular support, which later on is the reason they won. Yes. The second thing is Carlos knows because he's an organizer, but how did it help build your organizational capacity of the movement? I mean, we were huge. I mean, we went from having seven groups in about a year to go to 30. I mean, the, the movement grew dramatically. Not just us, a lot of groups emerged. I mean, it was crazy. So if I were to counsel Carlos, as an organizer, and he was depressed after the laid-back session, I would say, Carlos, that action was fucking awesome. That action produced, that action was the best thing that could happen to your movement. It was probably one of the most important historical actions the immigrant rights movement has ever done. But Carlos and all his, all his participants were depressed as hell. We were all depressed. And some people were, were leaving the movement because they felt depressed. Right, Carlos? Yes. I mean, there was all, we had all these infightings. I mean, I understand it was part of the struggle, uh, but it was tough on the whole movement, I think, on all of us. Yeah. Does that so, make sense for everybody? When you don't want to be victorious, all of a sudden visions, when, when you feel depressed, visions of becoming a professional dancer rise up within your consciousness. You know? or, be, or becoming lawyers, right? Or becoming lawyers. <laughs> Because at least as a dancer, you have a much clearer dynamic of what is a good dance move and what is not. What is success, right? Also, as a lawyer, you win cases or not. <laughs> okay. Um, you either win the case or you don't. Okay, great, folks. So we're gonna yeah. we're gonna open it up to your to your input right now. Um, please tell us if you you know experience any moments of failure or moments where there was you know, you were unclear if you were succeeding or if you were failing. Um, if you just type, uh, you know, just say that you want to speak or submit your question in the in the question tab, I'll unmute you and then you can share with us. If, 
you guys don't feel comfortable, you can just tell me an action that you did, and I will ask you questions to evaluate. <laughs> we can also not. do that. <laughs> so Kate you says, just tell me an action. Kate would like to speak, so I'm going to unmute her. And then um, in the meantime, if you think of anything that you either want to discuss or you want Paul to ask you questions about, um, please submit a question. Okay, Kate, you're unmuted now. Okay. Hey, y'all. Um, so, oh, can you mute? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, hold on, we're figuring out sound. Okay, beautiful, we're set. So um, here in Wisconsin, um, we had a governor elected in, in 2010, who then in the beginning of 2011 um, committed a variety of offenses against people, but the biggest one was that he like dramatically turned back workers' rights and took away public employees' um, ability to collectively bargain, um, essentially like undermining unions in our state. And um, so like over... The course of an entire year and a half, there was massive uprising, like moment of momentum, and then the energy was channeled into an electoral campaign to recall um, Governor Walker, which ended up losing um, in June of 2012, so like a full year and a half later after he started um, like these attacks. and. I think for us, I mean, people felt super, super defeated because it was hard to keep up that level of energy over that period of time. And then all of it was funneled towards the election. Like everything was framed as recall Walker. Like that became the movement. And so that was something that we obviously very concretely could see that we lost, like what was framed as the objective. Um, but the good thing about it is that like through that process and even now um, the I guess our movement as broadly defined as being like workers rights um, in Wisconsin is is dramatically amplified because before people were really just totally apathetic um, and we saw huge populations of people that weren't active before become activated but it makes me think about the way that it was framed because I think it really set us up for people to feel totally disempowered mm. to like frame the whole thing around an election and then plus the fact that even if we would have won the message recall Walker once he's out doesn't even apply anymore so it's like the banner under which we were united like kind of didn't doesn't make any sense anymore um, so yeah I guess those are my comments kind of in response to my experience well, with a moment that's great Kate you know, people ask me this all the time as a consultant because I do consultation with the labor movement, and they and they say, you know, like now it's when the Wisconsin uprising, as it's called, is seen as a failure, so no one wants to use any of the lessons of it. But the question that I have to ask is 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 really two parts, which is the uprising to try to stall or stop the passage of the elimination of collective bargaining, mm -hmm. and then the election. There's really two things, and when I ask people. Uh, the two questions I asked Carlos, which is, did the uprising, which is the occupation of the Capitol, all the mass protests and everything, for the and the fleeing of the legislators to other states to 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 basically um, filibuster the, the legislation, did that polarize the public to your side? Um, it dramatically polarized the public. Um, dramatically but I think you know it it polarized fairly evenly to the point where I think you know obviously we lost when it came down to the election that's like one measurement um, when it came down to the election we lost and I think that the margin by which we lost could possibly be explained by things like voter turnout um, it definitely didn't polarize it dramatically to our side, not enough, not enough to have a successful election. Yes. Well, I actually think those are two different questions because my my understanding of the metrics is that 55 to 60 percent polarized to your side, and then you you got a lot if if you measure the of the movement, it grew dramatically. But the problem is is the second question, which is did it build your organizational capacity? It did in some ways, but eliminated others because 
uh, the Republicans redistrict and because you lost uh, collective bargaining rights. Right. Does that make sense? So if, in some ways, the uprising was really successful at building your movement, but the elections were not. Mm. That's my sense of it, you know. And then the question is, would there have been alternative tactics to build your movement and to polarize more? Because it, it seems like the election, you actually lost public support during the election. You had more public support during the uprising than you did when you did the election. That's true, because people were more massively in agreement with defending the workers versus once it got reframed into we're going to recall a politician, that became something that people became polarized around is even the idea of whether recalling was like a moral thing to do in the middle of somebody's term. So then my, under yeah, my understanding of the polling is that actually 60% of the population was polled for the opposition when it came to the election. Mm -hmm. You actually lost active popular support during the election. Mm -hmm. And it reduced your organizational capacity because everyone was spending all their resources and they weren't actually absorbing the momentum of the movement. That, that's my sense of what, kind of what happened. Yeah. But I think that's a perfect example of how these, these you know, of how to use the metrics to understand success and failure. Yeah, thank you. Cool. So thanks for sharing so much, Kate. Um, we don't have any more questions, um, so I guess we can continue. Let's keep rolling. Let's keep rolling. Awesome. Let's roll. Let's roll. Okay. So. I'm muted. Yes, you should mute. You are. Okay. So then, okay. I don't know what's going on here with my mic, but okay. So, team, this piece is really about uh, that even though we might say that, and I think this is pretty cool, right, Paul, about that you're asking me these questions if we succeeded or not, and it's the best questions ever. But it's, even if we don't ask ourselves those questions, people are already measuring victories. And sometimes it's different people measuring different, you know, understandings of what victory it is, you know? So here in this part, we want to really talk about what are, because people have their own theories about what victory is their own assumptions. Uh, and sometimes they're unclear and sometimes or they're conflicted. Uh, so we want to talk about those. Uh, so Paul, rock and roll, bro. So um, in a lot of political theory, um, there's this concept of the inside and the outside game. That's what it's called, the inside game and the outside game of politics. Okay. And uh, really, like a lot of the other, we were talking about organizing traditions, and I would add to that cognitive frames that exist within organizing traditions, meaning that there's frames of how different dominant organizing traditions in the United States think about how to make change. If we, if we take a step back from structure and momentum, there's actually many more theories of change. There's yeah. many more organizing traditions, okay? And we're not going to go over every single one of them, but there's two major groups of basically how people think about change. Uh, Marshall Gantz talks about this as the two categories as transformational being the outside and inside being transactional mm -hmm. power. But we call it inside, outside, and within that we, we make distinction between three different mm -hmm. uh, cognitive frames organizational cultures um, and one is what we call the lobbyist approach and the lobbyist approach is really about how to take um, the a little amount of money or resources from a union or from your base and how to use it to pressure people leverage it within the parameters of the political debate that already exists within all the minute sort of political uh, insider game, policy wonky, talky, uh, relational, uh, a lot of it is dialogue, uh, but it's not dialogue that moves people outside of their frame. It really accepts things ha as they are. That's the lobbyist game. And there's people who are really good lobbyists. The second one is politicians. And the political game, there's a, there's a lot of like figures throughout history that have been 
um, really good at, about winning through the inside game as a politician. And this this concept, if anybody's seen House of Cards, the show on Netflix, but this is really how politicians use their power to gain more power and how they leverage their power through uh, their status, through um, committee chairs and different positions within their party, uh, within raising money and doling out different favors for people. It's the compromises they make. And as the great um, Upton Sinclair said, uh, a great um, progressive said, uh, policy making is like sausage, is like making sausage. Everyone wants to eat it, but no one wants to see how it is made because it is gross. It is morally <laughs> very Machiavellian. It's very, it's, it's about wheeling and dealing, which isn't very ethical, but this is how politicians function to make things happen. And the third one is a service approach. And what I mean by the service approach is people who, within the confines of whatever issue they're working on, they're trying to resolve the issue through taking the money that already exists or the interest that already exists around a cause like AIDS or, or in Africa around, um, around poverty and taking the, the resources that either the government is giving or foundations are giving and trying to provide the best services, uh, increasing the amount of services and the quality of services to address, for instance, the AIDS crisis or infectious diseases or, um, or mental health crisis or whatever. That's a really inside game. It's really working within the confines of, of the bureaucracy or within uh, funding that currently exists. It's not really thinking outside. You want to take the outside game? No, no, no. Keep going, Paul. Keep going. So the outside game, we, we talk about three things, and we've already talked about two of them in the first webinar, between structure and hybrid. And those, the hybrid approach, we said, is very different than the structure approach in that the structure approach is really trying to create leverage on the decision maker. And a lot of this is like, Basically, how the Sierra Club or a lot of advocacy groups, they're not lobbying, but what they're doing is they're getting their members to make phone calls. They're getting their members to do things uh, that leverage uh, the, the decision maker. In the unions, it's about getting the workers and the public to create leverage to move the corporate head to get them what they want. In the hybrid, we're not thinking as much about leverage. We're thinking about really going for the public, creating shifts in public opinion. But there's another one which we're going to get into. It's called the prefigurative way of thinking about outside. And what that is, is really thinking uh, about creating a counterculture or counter or alternative institutions outside the system and seeing that as an influence of change. So how do people think about creating social change within the prefigurative worldview? Well, the strategic framework is all the frameworks that I talked about before, whether strategic, momentum, politician, all those guys are thinking strategically. Prefigurative people are thinking differently. They're thinking about living the revolution. It's a lot more about lifestyle. It's, a, it's about being the change. Actually, who cares about changing the government or the other institutions? We have to, believe, we have to create an organization that lives the revolution, and strategic whether it's the politician or the lobbyists or, or the structure approach or momentum, is really thinking about how do we change the dominant institutions, uh, co dominant corporations, the market, the, the political system that affects everyone, my grandma, my mom, you know, everybody that won't necessarily join a hippie commune or a counterculture. It's really talking about how do we uh, change the lives of everyone in the public. Um, and by changing the predominant institutions and that we're really making change. So it's really, those organizations are really thinking about how, how to make change instead of how to be the change. And there's a whole different theory of change between these two dominant things. So the prefigurative has a here and now orientation. They're like, okay, does this institution right now live the revolution? Well, the strategic, they don't really care as much about that. They're really saying, are we going to win? Are we going to change things? The prefigurative is talking about, it's prioritizing the means or the processes, the day-to-day -day services of the organization or the institution. 
while the strategic is talking about the ends, the outcomes, the accomplishments, or the victories, prefigurative is more expressive and serviceable in tactics, meaning that they care more about whether or not the tactic expresses their values or their needs and meets their needs or services their needs. They could care less about whether or not the tactic actually creates the, the change or creates the pressure or the leverage or even creates public opinion changes. The prefigurative philosophy is less uh, interested in that. Um, it prioritizes cultural change. So it's really thinking about how do we live this, the, the revolution within our own culture. Um, instead of making an institutional change, it focuses on individuals and small groups. So, um, and, and the strategic approach really focuses on creating, uh, change, really focusing on building lots of organizations and movements that have power. And prefigurative really is less about that. It's sometimes people in prefigurative is really talking about changing or radicalizing people or changing their consciousness or having people live a different way or creating groups in which people can live different ways. So what are examples of that? philosophy. Well, you got the Amish, okay? So the Amish, if, if you think about it in the prefigurative world, they have like, I think they have like 200,000 people, which is bigger than some of the most powerful unions in the United States of America, okay? They are very big and they live a very radical lifestyle. It's not necessarily um, good for women. <laughs> there's a, there's, it definitely uh, doesn't have a feminist critique. There's really divided gender roles, but in a lot of ways, it's socialist, it's decentralized, it's organic, it's, it's, it's pre-industrial. So in a lot of ways, they live a very radical lifestyle that is in conflict with capitalism, that's in conflict with the mainstream culture of consumer capitalism. But they could care less about whether or not they're having any political uh, effects or they don't try to do consumer boycotts, they just don't participate in at all in the consumer behavior within the United States of America. And because of that, they really don't have much influence politically or economically. But among their 200,000 members, they have incredible amounts of influence. Another thing is the anarchist subculture is another one. There's a lot of ways in which the anarchist subculture talks about their prefigurative philosophy. One of the ways they talk about it is temporary autonomous zones. What does temporary autonomous zones mean? It means that actions in creating alternative culture temporarily within an occupation or within a squat, a, a squat uh, taking over a, a building and living it, living in it, and creating a revolution within those little spaces is is uh, they, they believe a strategic way to engage the public. But what it's really looking at is how do we create a pure alternative, a pure countercultural alternative. And they have all these different visions of what it means to do tactics that, that feed their values of having freedom, being able to express one's individual um, ideas and anger and feelings. And, and they have all these philosophies and there, there is this amazing um, book um, by Laura Portman, which talks, did, did an anthropological study of the entire anarchist movement and talks about how basically all the subcategories and stuff, how predominantly in the United States of America, 90% of the anarchists are, are very prefigurative and not strategic um, in how they think about things. Last one, brother. So um, this is also, you see this in music scene, uh, these, these, these sort of, uh, they don't, people don't want to be part of the mainstream music scene. They want to create a new culture, a new music scene that, uh, that meets their needs to be different. Uh, the punk music scene, electronica music scene, even intellectual, there's an existential uh, movement uh, that used to be big, especially in the, in, uh, the 70s and 80s. But it's basically people who have all these different philosophies of how to live their life and even academically or philosophically uh, live their lives. And, and, and these people, they really define themselves against the norm. So they don't want the norm to embrace their values. They want to create a safe place, a place that, that actualizes their culture. Um, and, and they're scared about it being co-opted. So 
So I'll, like I was saying, one of the things about how prefigurative philosophies express um, their, 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 how they judge, the metrics of how they judge in action, and I saw this all the time in the global justice movement that I participate in, and especially in Occupy. And what a lot of times when we were fighting, mm -hmm. um, uh, we had these big strategic debates about is the movement winning, is the movement not? And in, in the global justice movement, uh, people who believed that we were creating a carnival of resistance, we were creating a temporary autonomous zone where we shut down the city and we occupied the city, and they would judge success and failure a lot of times by whether or not it, it expressed this radical ideal of whether or not it, it used consensus. And we showed that there was another, another world is possible, which is a, 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 a motto. Um, in Occupy, we have this big debate, I remember quite distinctly, a whole group of people really argued that the goal of the occupation was the occupation itself. That if we lost the occupation, the movement was dead, and that the goal of Occupy was really to show that there was going to be alternative world and that's alternative to democracy within the occupation. And these people were very concerned with the process of consensus decision making, of how we organized, of how we treated each other in the occupation. So they're very interested in that. And what I will say about this is we're not saying that these are bad, um, these are bad uh, ways of thinking. There are strengths and weaknesses to this way of being. Some of the strengths is that it gets people to be very committed and it allows people to have an in-group identity um, that makes people very committed to the action um, outside of the, whether or not the public or the media or other people are called Occupy uh, a piece of crap and it wasn't successful and you didn't have any demand and the prefigurative people didn't really care because they were more focused on the action scenario in itself and they were very committed to, to, to living out the revolution at the occupation and staying there night after night. So there's a lot of strength in this prefigurative philosophy. Um, there's also a lot of weaknesses because if you judge a movement based on the action scenario, there's a lot of problems that happen. If you judge it based on the processes that you do, um, see, a lot of times that isolates the public. And the, uh, there's a great thinker uh, who I know, Jonathan Matthew Smucker, he calls this the political identity paradox. And basically, the philosophy of prefigurative communities is about creating counterculture against the norm. It's not about engaging the norm. So how do you embrace the prefigurative philosophy without it killing your movement? And he calls that the political identity paradox. And we're going to get into that in part three. But it's, it's very important to say there's strengths to that way of thinking, but there's also really big negatives. And it doesn't fit within the philosophy of the hybrid model, which is the metrics of how you judge success and failure based on what we know popular movements need to do to win. Thank you, bro. That was good. Uh, so, team, we talked about prefigurative. Uh, and now we're going to talk about structure. Again, all of them we're talking in the context of the outside uh, theories of victory. So in the structure, really, uh, another way to really think about this is about instrumental demands. And I know we all have experience about this. But what does instrumental demands really mean? Well, it means, number one, it really is about winning practical demands that build the institution or the organization and that really affect or affect our members uh, through massive creations of leverage, right? Uh, so, for example, we have to pass in state tuition for undocumented students. It clearly affects the lives of undocumented young people that want to go to college, getting a driver's license, uh, right? Increasing uh, the minimum wage, like that's the fight that is going on in Massachusetts right now to increase the minimum wage. Uh, so there's multiple what we consider instrumental demands or also policy changes that if this certain law changes or if the certain policymaker will change this, then, you know, we will get certain concrete specific change that the people that we're trying to organize will receive and then they will do more. The second piece around instrumental demands is really about creating a more powerful organization. Meaning like, is are we really growing? Are we increasing committees? Are we increasing churches that we're working with or increasing schools that we're organizing with? If you're a labor union, do you have more workers, more contracts? That means more dues. Are you organizing more foundations? Are more people funding you? Do you more rich people that are giving you resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty much also similar to the to what we were saying around 
polarization and organizational capacity, but here you would probably more call it organizational capacity and policy changes or instrumental demands as the measurements of victory, victory from the structured tradition. This is also seeing team that I think with the instrumental demands are asking primarily themselves the questions about what is it winnable with the leverage we have? And I don't know how many of you have read uh, Solalinsky's book, Rules for Radicals, or many of the other books in the structured tradition of organizing. There's all this focus about really knowing if an issue is winnable based on your organizational strength and the political dynamics happening. Can we win this issue? And really sometimes organizations will not take issues that are most popular because they feel like they cannot win them. They feel like if they would go to the state house, if they would go to the legislature, and they will meet with the legislators that they won't have enough one-to-one -one power negotiating ability to do that. So there's tons of instrumental demands. Like, for example, in the immigration context, uh, there is something called the tenure bar, which means that when people leave the country uh, after a period of, quote-unquote, being unlawfully present in the United States, people get a tenure bar, meaning that they cannot come back through a legal channel uh, because of this tenure bar law. Uh, well, that's great. Well, I think if we will stop the 10-year bar, we will have a significant amount of people getting legalized. It is not an issue that really it's popular. Nobody really understands it. But in the structured tradition, somebody, for example, here in Change.org said we need to stop immigration's 10-year bar, you know. And when we go to D.C., we got to advocate to stop the, you know, it's also the 10-year bar so that more people can legalize. That's really the approach of the structure. It's very instrumental. Uh, Paul, do you want to talk from the union perspective? So in the unions, uh, a lot of times unions are, they're just thinking about what they can win. So like in the global justice movement, we were trying to create huge demands that really dramatize the problems of corporate globalization, like poverty in Africa, the fact that AIDS drugs can't be given because pharmaceutical companies control, phar pharma you know, control medicine that eliminate um, millions and millions of, of people that are poor and have HIV cannot get AIDS drugs because uh, pharmaceutical companies um, uh, regulate, you know, whether copyright laws and stuff. Well, the steel workers just were trying to create tariffs for steel workers. That's what they were really focusing on. Well, that wasn't good about building support because people, you know, cared about a whole bunch of issues around corporate globalization. Very few people actually cared about steel workers tariffs that protected steel workers against. Chinese steel workers who didn't have any environmental or labor regulations that could pay their workers shit. Or like hardship neutrality, well, most people don't know what that means, but for most labor unions, the rules that dictate whether or not uh, workers can join a union are incredibly important to labor unions. But the public doesn't understand them, and not only the public doesn't understand them, it's really not good to build a popular support around labor, the labor cause. Maybe minimum wage is something everyone can relate to, and it's a popular demand or a symbolic demand, but hardship neutrality is a really horrible one. But I can tell you, I would say half of all the fights, labor fights, are about hardship neutrality because that's what they're fighting for for their members. That's right. And even, uh, Paul, can I say this? Even on the immigrant rights movement, there's this huge fight between having broad popular demands and legislative demands. And we can see a lot of people pushing for asking people to support bills. Please support Bill S, S, whatever, 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 or House Bill this and this. And people in the public get confused, but this is how a lot of people from the structure, both from policy organizations, major labor unions, even major organizational institutions, think about change. Think that they have to figure out how can they move their members to push other uh, politicians to support their cause. Um, you know, and some, some of them do it through different ways of leverage. One last part that I would add around this thing about instrumental is the LIPO strategy. And also structure really starts very small. It really really starts with thinking about what is a demand that your people have the power with. And think about this. When you're trying to organize a committee of people, six to eight people, it's small. You're not thinking you're going to take over the government or you're going to take over your state. You're really thinking, well, what is it they can do? And sometimes it starts in small issues like fixing the LIPOs, you know. Uh, picking up the trash, you know, uh, making sure the trash gets picked up by the uh, by the janitorial services of the city or the town. So it's very small, right? 
So we just went through, I want to go back to, we just went to instrumental demands, which is the way the structure approaches demands. And then Paul also went through prefigurative, which is kind of the counterculture, subculture ways of living the revolution now, leaving the change now, and really saying that that's victory. Once you create it, once you live up the change, you're being victorious, right? If the occupation happens, we're still here, the, you know, the movement is alive. But now we want to talk about the third thing that we were mentioning, which is the hybrid. So how does the hybrid model frame victory? So how does that one work? And this is the last and third part of our webinar, and then we'll close it up and we'll, we'll get some uh, questions and comments from all of you. But this is really how we're claiming of how you can frame the movement victoriously. So the first one is, oh, go ahead, Bob. Well, I just want to say before we go into this is yeah. that we just painted out all these different theories, okay? And they're all, if you go into a movement, you could predict in every movement all these conflicts uh, that are going to come up because of these conflicting theories of change. And in webinar four, when we say common problems, it's very similar. We predict all the common problems that the movement goes through because of these conflicting theories of change. And it gives you, a, like, you're like a mad scientist when you understand this stuff. Because I can go with my brother, we write articles, and I can predict what are the most common problems that, that any, almost any movement throughout the globe is going to have. Because every movement has these conflicting theories of change. Okay? And what we're talking about here is really one element of how the conflicting theories of change fight with each other. And that is how they think about the theory of change, but also how they frame victory, how they see progressive steps forward. And they see that in a very different way. So right now we just painted out six different conflicting theories. And within the movement, you're really going to work on the three outside. Most of the people in your movement, they're, they're probably only participating in your movement because they want to play the outside game. So most of the time, you're going to be really focusing on the, out, the three conflicting theories on the outside. And occasionally, when you go into Washington, D.C., and Carlos can tell you this over and over and over again, if you're, if you're an outside movement and you go to Washington, D.C., you get really pissed off with the lobbyists and with people who are trying to play the – and politicians who are trying to play the inside game because they have a whole – different way of thinking about change and framing victory, and they sh crap on the outside game because for them, that's not how real change happens. So there, there, there is times when you will find that. And the media and the public, we're going to get into it, they, they don't have any clear frame of that. So, uh, but I just wanted to go over the basics of why we painted uh, all those different conflicting theories. Thank you, brother. This is really, really good. Because <laughs> there's so much conflict around it. I mean, there's even conflict within the inside and the outside between tons of organizations, even internally. You know, how much should we lobby? How much should we organize outside? There's all this stuff. Now, we won't get on the minutia of all the inside and outside. We're just really trying to address the outside theories of change. But the way that we're thinking, um, team, that we want to frame this thing is by doing, is by holding both. Now, what does holding both mean? is that for the movement to really seen or to be seen as successful or that is advancing, right, which really helps it gain control, legitimacy, power, participation, resources, really, it really needs to focus on two groups. The first group is the movement participants or the base. We really have to make sure that whatever we're doing, the base understands whatever the heck we're trying to do. Because, because if we don't, somebody else is going to control it. It's either going to be the media or any of the other other theories that we said there are, right? Somebody's going to say, like, no, 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 victory is to recall a politician or victory is to pass this legislation. And maybe that's not what your movement wants to do. So really, it's one, focusing on the movement and the participants. And the second one, which is very important, is the media and the public. Really got to figure out how to hold this context of reality versus the theory. The theater, I'm sorry. And that to know that in the media, pretty much we're playing a theater because it's a game of perception. How is a movement being successful? If you haven't if you haven't yet won legislation, quote unquote, if you're still winning public support, it's really a game of theater. 
because the media is not going to quantify and say, well, you know, based on our public, popular public support theory of change that we all know, this movement just gained 3% more public support, so they are winning, you know, give a club to the movement X. It's not going to happen. <laughs> the media does not understand that, right? So you got to be able to figure out how to frame it so that as you are advancing with, first with public support and this with popular support, then the people in the media, or at least that projection of your movement, seems like it's advancing, like the theater of your movement is moving. Paul, you want to add some thoughts on this one? Well, I think they're, they're in the next slide, sort of my comments. Let's rock and roll then. So um, we need to understand uh, that, uh, and, and th this is really very unique to when we talk about the hybrid model, uh, we're talking about decentralized organizational model. And we're also talking about a model that's a popular movement that wins through engaging not just the structure or your members, but actually mobilizing the entire population to win, to get a critical mass of the population. So that's why we see these theories of victory needs to be framed in these two different levels. When it comes to the participants, when you have a hierarchical organization or a structure, whether or not the structure expands or what the structure does has to do with your leadership that is really the head and the brains and the strategic power of your movement. But in this case, everyone has to know, we need to understand and measure our own metrics so that we are not confused by other theories and can be organized by others. Your participants, uh, we don't have the luxury of whether or not they listen to the union leadership that says, no, we didn't lose, we actually had a success, and they, in, a, in a good union structure, the, the leadership can control the messaging of what was successful and what was failure. We're a decentralized movement. We can't do that. So we have to learn how to teach everyone so that they know how to do strategy and they know how to victory within the metrics, which we should, again and again, I'm going to say this, what are the two metrics? One, measuring polarization towards the movement. Are we moving the majority or a super majority towards the movement, and are we engaging our base and creating a bigger base? And number two, are we building organizational capacity? And we're different than a structure because our structure is much more open. Our movement is much more broad and decentralized. And our ladder of engagement is much bigger. So we need to educate our members to the theory of change and how to measure that. And this is helped by the three concepts that we talked about really help with this. One is mass training. Everyone goes through initiation training where they have the same theory of change. They have a grand strategy where they're understanding how everything is fit within the general principle. So it takes the theory and it puts it into a strategy of how to win active public support and get a critical mass of active public support and how that actually translates to winning, which a lot of times has to do with winning federal legislation. But that's like the end game. The real game is about whether or not you can get enough of the public to sway towards your movement and be involved in your movement. And then what we call the plan format. And what the plan format is, is really teaching, having a ritual that everyone goes through in your movement is used to. And many organizations have this. Even structured tradition has a plan format. The Midwest Academy and a lot of Alinskyite organizing, they have a plan format where whenever they do an action, they, they go through a list of questions that ask, is this strategic? And does this fit our metrics? Does this help? And then they write up their action, their explanation, of their action in a common format and they present it to the entire movement. This is why we're doing our action, this is why the action is strategic, and this is how we measure victory. It's part of the plan format. And maybe you can talk a little bit more about the plan format, Carlos. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think essentially, I, I know we're a little rushed with time, but um, I think essentially maybe, Paul, to recap what you're mentioning, mentioning, right, is that it's so important that through training, through dissemination, even on the way people plan their actions, is that people have clarity in what the theory of change is. And also in what the su success look like for the movement, set by the movement and really not by external forces. And, and I cannot stress that 
uh, as much and I feel like I've been, I fell so many times at it, you know, <laughs> that I've been going into fights where I didn't frame the fights, that we didn't frame the fights with the team. We maybe frame thought the framing, but that somebody else framed it better or we got into a situation that was already framed for us. So it, it is so important that first that we frame, but then second is that we allowed everybody in our members as we launch or even in the midst of the struggles it happens, that everybody gets on the same page. Now, why is this important? This is what I will share with you was important. Uh, there is, uh, let me go through this next slide here because that will be useful. There is this uh, movement theorist, uh, Bill Moyer, and he wrote a book called, uh, he wrote a book that talks about the eight movement stages. So he pretty much says that there's eight stages that every movement goes through, you know, and he gives examples of the civil rights movement, he gives examples of the anti-nuclear movement, multiple movements, he puts them into this context. and. There will be probably another time we can go through them, but there's one stage that is super key, uh, which is stage five. And in stage five is called perception of failure. And it comes after uh, what it's called stage four, which is uh, kind of a target or a peak moment or a moment of the whirlwind to say, right? When you have tons of momentum and you polarize the public and things are going on well for your movement and then something fails and you feel like the momentum is gone. And then people get depressed. And this happened, for example, to me in the immigrant rights movement in 2006, we would see a slide about that, which in 2006, you know, you have millions of people on the street, right? Largest mobilization in U.S. history. All of us are freaking, super freaking Latino on the street. There's everybody, Asians, everybody, we're on the streets rocking and rolling. We're like, we're going to win this thing, you know? You know, but we're thinking we're going to reclaim Mexico. I mean, it's just like huge, huge marches, right? Everything is going to happen. And then in 2007, it's like, we're not like the mega marches. We're like the mega small marches. <laughs> you know, we're like so few people. So what happens at that point of the movement is that there's this perception of failure. Even though the movement had made us advance into the next stage and get towards a place where Latinos got more politicized, they started voting, quote unquote, more democratic and more supporting of an immigrant agenda, which didn't exist before the 2006 movement, right? People in the movement felt demoralized because first of all, even though the objective was to uh, eliminate Sense and Brenner, which was this anti-immigrant law that was going to make it really hard for our community to criminalize us, it stopped it. Most people in the movement thought that if we had, we needed to win legalization. Within the struggle, there was another frame that we had to win legalization, and because we didn't win it, that the marches didn't work out, right? And again, this was not shared by everybody, by most people have different theories of change with what happened in the marches. Some people thought it was awesome. Some people thought it was a waste of time. A lot of people will tell you, well, why the heck did we march? We didn't achieve anything. What was all this marching about, right? So I'll go through this part, but really in the movement, what happens in this stage is the numbers are down to demonstrations. There's less media, you know, long-range goal, like legalizations are not met, right? And there's this super unrealistic hopes of the quick sources are met, right? Like, oh, we did not win legalization. That wasn't even worth it. And then it's like, you know, and now we just got to become more radical because, you know what, like, we have to be more intense. I mean, it's just, it disorganizes the movement. Now, the power holders in the media really claim that the movement has failed. And in 2007, we saw that, right? The men and men emerge. They become stronger. There's all this anti-immigrant policies that were raids in the factories, right? I mean, really seeing, like, the movement loss. The power holders are going to be winning this fight. That's how we see, even though we were winning public support. Uh, and then in the in the movement, you know, there's all these different subcultures emerging. I mean, I think the immigrant rights movement in 2006, there was all these May Day coalitions that in my take, you know, uh, at the time, uh, you know, a very young uh, organizer at the time, well, I'm still pretty young, but very young, I was probably 19 or something or 20 or 21, you know, going to these meetings where most people were not immigrants and where most people were like people that I have never even seen in my life. You know, I wasn't organizing in Boston for many years, but they were taking the coalitions and it was all about we got to be harder May 1st and now we got to talk. This is not migrant rights. It's about all workers' rights. And now we got to talk about 20 more million issues. And in 2007, now you don't have one single march with one single message. You have like 20 marches, <laughs> you know, which is still happening in the immigrant rights movement. I mean, last March, last May Day March in LA had five different marches, five different messages, right? So that's a little bit of this movement stage and this stage of perception of failure, right? And maybe, uh, Paul, you want to talk about uh, April 16th. So um, I thought that was a great example of uh, 2006 when I was part of it. 
uh, about stage five perception of failure as a movement. You know, in uh, in the uh, anti-globalization movement, or or we call it the global justice movement, Seattle was seen as a great success. We shut down the WTO negotiations. Everyone saw the special, and there was tons of momentum, and people were building up for the next mobilization, which we were going to shut down the yearly meeting for the World Bank and IMF. And we framed the, the, the victory uh, as whether or not we could shut it down. But in this case, they knew exactly what we were going to do. We used exactly pretty identical strategy from what we did in Seattle. And we weren't able to shut down the meetings. Okay? But we got front page New York Times coverage in Washington, D.C. They shut down the federal government for two days. It was a huge story. And because of that, if by our metrics, by winning um, polarization of the public, a lot of groups like Jubilee 2000, which was trying to win debt relief for Africa and for a lot of different countries, for the United States because they're in chronic debt, their issue flourished. They got tons of publicity about how um, the IMF and World Bank was destroying their country. And so when it, when it actually meant about creating awareness and polarizing the public towards the, our cause, we won tremendously. Um, but the movement felt failure because it wasn't, it framed the issue as whether or not we shut down the meeting. And a lot of the organizations actually grew. Uh, I knew um, the National uh, Labor Committee by uh, Charlie Kernigan, uh, 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 I considered a friend at the time, uh, his organization doubled in size and, and email list and all this other stuff. A lot of the people in the coalition were really growing. The movement was growing. But people were so depressed. And after A16, because people felt depressed, there was all this infighting about what to do next. There was all these people that advocated for diversity of tactics and violence because they, they, they were trying to persuade the public and the media that we had to do something different because it was seen as a failure. And a lot of people uh, dropped out of the movement. Hey, guys, I just want to do a, t a quick time check because it's 8.30 and we said that we were going to end at 8.30. Um, so just to honor people's time, um, how much longer do you think uh, we have left? I know we started late. Uh, I think we have uh, about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, cool. So for the participants on the line, we have about 10 or 15 minutes left, and then we'll open it to questions. But um, we just want to be respectful of your time. If you need to leave um, right now, we'll honor that. Um, but otherwise, we ask you to please stay with us. Thank you for the goodness. Okay. We'll look pretty good today. Okay. Should we keep rocking, bro? Yes. So <laughs> when could, could we get the slide with the three different frames? So yeah. um, with with the hybrid model, if we're going to intentionally create um, the frame of how we frame our actions and our movement, um, we call uh, so we are going to uh, choose what frame we use, okay? We're going to choose it intentionally. And there's a couple choices here. And within, the, within movements, there, within popular movements, uh, and within uh, our theory of change, which we call the hybrid model, but a lot of it comes from civil resistance, um, there's really these three primary ways of choosing how to frame victory. And we're going to go over each one. And one is called by, by framing victories by winning symbolic demands, by winning action scenarios, or by winning strategic objectives. And each movement, if you analyze, you can go around the globe, and you can go around in a lot of popular movements in the United States, and you can see how the movement, a lot of the leaders sometimes have made a choice to try to frame the victory in this way. Mm -hmm. And what we're advocating is you need to do that, and you need to do that in a systemic way through mass training. You need to get, and with the press, you need to, to really communicate that very clearly with your participants and with the press. So first one we're going to go over is symbolic demand. So what well, are symbolic demands? Go ahead. I think it's important, Tim, to understand that we are not trying to say one is better than the other that we're actually letting you know that there's three different frames that you can choose. It really depends on your context and your situation. And each of them have strengths and weaknesses. 
to them. But really what we're going to go over them is for you to think, okay, well, in my movement, in my campaign, in the work that I'm doing, which, which frame should I use? Which frame could be effective uh, for us to win? And we've seen that there's victory in all those three, but there's also massive failure in those three as well. So that's why we want to share them. Uh, go ahead. And I, I want to say this too. I wish somebody would have told me this way back in the day of the global justice movement because I wasn't conscious. I, I just didn't even think about it. I was like a fish in water. You know, I didn't understand it. I think the counterculture that I was part of just thought of victory in one way. What we're saying is you can actually choose, okay? So, but we're holding both. We're holding both. This is, this is like choosing how we frame it within the, the theater. Well, we, we still have to hold the reality of the metrics. And those are the two questions I go over again. What are the two questions? Polarization towards our side, getting active public support, and organizational development within our ladder of engagement, which is a movement ladder of engagement. Those are the real metrics in which the leaders should evaluate success and failure, but we cannot expect the public and the media in, uh, is going to understand that. So we have to frame the victory and success of every step of the way within a frame that we get to choose. Perfect, brother. Let's go over symbolic demands. Okay. So the first one, you want to go up to the slide yeah. about okay. symbolic versus instrumental? Yeah, I got you. Okay. Um, so uh, this is the most common question. Whenever I do trainings, everyone asks, what's the symbolic demands versus instrumental demands? Well, we already went over instrumental demands within the structured approach, which is what is winnable with the leverage you have and what is deeply felt. Symbolic demands are different. They, what are they? They are the most popular demands around the issue. What is deeply felt by an entire base, not steel workers or union members or just one person, but what is felt by even the DREAM Act, okay, is actually a very popular issue because it affects huge portions of the population are affected by DREAM Act, okay? Like something that would be very small would be something that only of like in a very small locality, like the, it, it is only understood by the membership, not by the general population. So what is deeply felt by the entire base outside of our membership and what builds active popular support? And when you ask that question, what happens is structured people say, why would you even fight for those things? Because they're not winnable. And we don't care, we care less about what's winnable we care more about building a popular movement that changes the climate. It might take us a while, but to, what is the cause that will be able to build our capacity as a movement and in the end win through popular opinion, which is a different way of thinking about uh, demand. We're thinking about demand that will uh, that, that will build popular support regardless of whether or not we have the leverage. We're going to create the leverage through a popular movement. So they're designed to generate the most amount of public support, not around leverage, and they think about what is the most popular issues. And so, you know, if, if you just think about it, if you, in any issue group, in any issue group, you say labor, what is the most, if you did polling, what is the most popular issues around labor? Well, minimum wage gift. Okay? If you uh, did polling around education or around, um, uh, you know, at the university, what would be the most popular issue for college students? Educational funding, okay? Uh, whether or not they, they pay debt, that, that affects everybody, right? Whether or not they're free public education and also the quality of public schools is a popular issue. And these are things that politicians know because they've polled on them and they've realized that those are the most important issues. The, the, the nature of the economy, whether or not people are able to get jobs, Social Security and Medicare are constantly on the list of the most important and most popular issues. And there's even small issues that if you pull around people, even though they're very small, symbolically they're very important for people. Uh, a one in, within the bank fees and uh, in the Occupy movement there was all this activity around uh, canceling uh, your membership at a bank. And if you do polling around it, people hate bank fees and ATM fees. Everyone hates Everyone them. Hates them. Everyone hates them. They're very popular, and they're felt by a huge portion of the population, not just you know members uh, of of a union. So, and there's a whole tradition of the movement picking symbolic demands. The one we talk about most is Gandhi, and Bon Durant, who wrote Conquest of Violence. She talks about this a lot about how yes. Gandhi picked issues 
that didn't make sense for the structured organizers or the unions or the political parties of his time. So, for instance, the SALT march, um, a lot of people, when he actually started negotiating uh, around, he created this huge campaign in which a, huge, a large portion of the Indian population participated in non-cooperating uh, with the British government and making their own salt and breaking the law. Hundreds of thousands of people went to jail. Um, there were people that died for, through being getting beaten by British police. And when he negotiated at the end, people thought he sold out the movement because all he was really symbolically fighting for and which he demanded to win was some sort of symbolic concession to say that I started this fight around the principle that everyone should be able to have access to salt without the British monopoly. And, the, and to have dialogue with the government about independence, which was really symbolic because there was no strings attached or whatever. But Gandhi did many campaigns around this sort of stuff. He, he did many campaigns where it was fought around symbolic things like untouchables, being able to walk through public plazas and, and be able to go into temples when they were discriminated against. He had a full campaign around that, which wasn't, it was really symbolic about the dignity of un, untouchability, not around um, these big instrumental campaigns. And it wasn't about these campaigns really weren't demanding in the end, he didn't frame victory as whether or not he kicked out the British. He framed it around whether or not um, they, it eliminated the salt tax. Uh, the Birmingham campaign. There's a famous thing in history where the Birmingham campaign, they picked one city to try to to symbolically claim that we're going to break the back of segregation in the South, and we're going to go after Birmingham, which uh, the, the quote was, uh, it was called Bombingham because they would bomb. Uh, there was all this bombing of civil rights workers, and uh, there were people that were killed through the brutality of, of the Ku Klux Klan and uh, the racists in the South. And so they picked Birmingham as, as a symbolic city to desegregate on. And they invested massive amounts of resources just to win a symbolic fight there. And at the end, when they were making nego when they were negotiating around success and failure, um, Fred Shuttleworth, who was a local leader, said that Martin, Martin Luther King sold out because all he was trying to win was these small symbolic victories. Um, a good example of this is he just wanted one clerk that was white to be in the department stores. Okay, but Fred Shuttleworth was like, we had we had people dying, we had school children that were killed by racists, and all you're going to win is desegregation in the, these downtown stores of one store clerk or the, the, the right for us to eat at a lunch counter? Who cares? Like, what we really care about is desegregating everything, the universities, the schools, all this stuff. He was thinking long term, and Martha King said, no, it's, it's not. The real metrics about whether or not we win is whether or not we win the public opinion, the hearts and minds of the American public was won in Birmingham. If, if anybody does the polling, they'll realize that the civil rights movement won in Birmingham. Uh, and uh, a year later, they won the famous Civil Rights Act uh, um, of 1964. Uh, happened, and most people, even Lynn Johnson, admit that that happened because of Birmingham um, and the March on Washington. But at the time, it was hard for people to imagine uh, that the little victory in Birmingham symbolically and, and picking and making concessions and claiming victory around such a small local demand was actually uh, important. So they had a lot of fights in the end, but they claimed Birmingham as victoriously because they framed it around a symbolic demand around desegregating a few downtown stores and having uh, negotiations to continue the, the dialogue, which really symbolically was important, but it, it really didn't have any strings attached, and most activists thought it was pathetic. But the public and the media and everyone in the, in the movement really felt that Birmingham was a success. So let me talk to all about strategic objectives, and I think we have to just move a little bit quicker um, just around this piece. 
but really, I think a strategic objective is the movement has to define uh, success based on the things that the movement can control. It has to measure pretty much its own metrics, and it has to give kind of the movement enough space to move around those metrics. So, for example, one example will be, look, we're going to be successful if we get 10,000 people to sign this petition. Or we're going to be successful if we, uh, you know, for example, shut down this bridge, even if it's for an hour or two or for a day, you know, we're going to be successful. It's really, it's really about defining things uh, that you can define success about. So, for example, like, even I think the, the marches were very successful because they were successful about people marching. And in those moments, that was meeting the strategic objective when you had millions of people on the street, you know. Uh, but of course, it's not the only thing you need, you know. So they have to be really vague and open to, because when they get more specifics, they get a little bit more tricky. So, for example, the students in Serbia that are with had something like about unifying the opposition. It's very open, because actually there were multiple ways to unify the opposition, right? Do you mean like two parties come together? Do you mean it's this coalition? I mean, there could be hundreds of ways that that uh, formation could have happened, but it's really about having brought and really having the movement in some ways trying to control that. Bob? So the other one that I want to say, and I'll be quick about this, is that uh, with strategic objectives, uh, there's also action scenarios, which is the movement can define an action scenario of we're going to be disruptive, or we're going to shut down a bridge, or we're going to occupy for 10 days, and it's going to look this way. And by doing that, the public and the media and the participants see the action in itself and the goals of the action in itself as victory or success. So uh, if, if Occupy would have said, we're going to occupy to bring public awareness, and if we occupy with 100 people in, um, in, uh, during, uh, in Wall Street, we will have won. Or like, we're going to be disruptive, or we're going to shut down, like we did this thing where we said we're going to shut down Century Boulevard in, um, during the, the hotel workers' uh, battle to win living wages for hotel workers in Los Angeles. Century Boulevard, we said one day the action will be successful if we shut down um, the Century Boulevard. Well, we get to define what, what shut down is. So we, we shut it down for a couple of hours. We, we knew we could negotiate that with the police. The police allowed us to shut down Century Boulevard. We claimed victory, and everyone saw it as victorious. So you get to define the action scenario if you say that. You get to define that we're going to do this action. We're going to, to do postering, and we're going to send out thousands of posters everywhere. And that's an action scenario, and it's very similar to strategic objectives. Strategic objectives can include action scenarios. Thank you, bro. So, Tim, let's end this part, and maybe, Belinda, you can join us so we can get some opinions at the end. But we have the three symbolic demands. We put some examples as the Salt March, the Birmingham campaign. What are the strengths of that? It's very easy for the public to understand them because they're symbolic. You can really get support. They're super broad. Um, and you can get a, a lot of support, even if the people that the public doesn't take action, right? But what are the weaknesses of this? Really super hard to control the responses. You're really on the hook of the demand, right? So, for example, in Birmingham, if the, nothing would have happened, if they wouldn't have compromised with King, would have been had been successful. Same thing with Gandhi with the Salt March. Then some of the action scenarios, and then both you can do strategic objectives, right? Like for example. Seattle, you know, shut the fucker down or occupy the occupation is the goal. Those are some of the examples of the things that happen in such scenarios, right? So what is the strength of that? Is that it builds a lot of suspense for the action. You know, like it's, it's like you're doing this massive activity where the whole thing is the action. So it builds a lot of things and it's much more easy control to demands because you're there doing the activity. This is what happens, I think, with the big weakness is that people get connected to the action, which is what happened in Occupy, right? As long as we occupy, we're doing this thing. So what happens when the police kick the crap out of people and kick them out? The movement is seen as failure, right? Because they put all of their chips in the action scenario. All strategic objectives? So strategic objectives, the, the good part about strategic objectives is when you define the success of your movement based on organizational considerations that you can control and also don't, don't have a timeline, you pretty much know you're always going to win it because you can keep on escalating until you win it. And it's the movement that gets to control whether or not you meet those goals, whether or not you get a, a million people on a pledge. You're going to keep on doing things until you get a million people on the pledge. And so you know you're going to win sooner or later. 
you get to control that. But the problem is, is people are like, who cares if you get a million people on the pledge? You still didn't win this. You still didn't win that. People don't understand that the movement's power is a stepping stone for victory. The public has a hard time understanding that. And participants have a hard time understanding that. They don't understand the organizational strength or that the movement's objective. Um, it doesn't. It's not clear uh, like a demand is that the the movement won something. Uh, instead, they, you have to really train the public and, and your members to really believe and be excited by these objectives that you create. And it's harder for the so it's very hard for the public to understand, uh, and also to create suspense because it's very suspenseful in Birmingham because they're going to escalate until the opposition gives them what they want. So they could escalate, uh, you know, until until people are being beaten and thousands and thousands of people in jail, and the media is asking the question, how long is this going to go on until the opposition gives them their demand? It creates a lot of pressure towards the opposition. But with strategic objectives, it doesn't do that because the public doesn't feel their suspense because they're, they're like, well, it doesn't really matter. The movement gets to control it. That's right. Thank you, bro. So, team, thank you so much for joining us in this webinar. We really want to take a note. Uh, we spent a little bit over time. We'll start a little bit later. But we'd love to hear from all of you uh, or some of you. Just, well, first, what are some of your reactions? What are you getting out of this webinar? What, what is being useful? And what are maybe some of the questions or comments that you might have? So, go ahead, Bell. Hey, so um, thank you again for sticking on a little bit later. Um, and if you have a question, please type it in the, in the question tab and I'll call on you individually. So again, what we're looking for is, um, you know, what jumped out at you, what was really useful. Um, and if things were unclear, um, feel free to ask questions about that too. And one thing to note is that since this is all brand new material, it's actually very, very useful for us to hear um, what was useful to you or what you found interesting because it really helps us as we develop our training programs. So even if you don't feel like you have it completely figured out, if there was just something that like, you know, got you thinking in a different way, um, please let us know because that's very, very helpful information to us. Or if there's something that was completely unclear, um, that's, that's also very helpful. Okay, so we have one comment from Kate. She says that one thing that was really useful to her was to define clearly within the group what the metrics are to measure victory so you don't get confused with other models or varying expectations. Thank you, Kate. So one of the things I want to say just, and there's one more slide that I, I'd like to just go over real quick. Which one? Um, it's at the very end, which it says, claim victory and run. Um, no, claim here. victory and run. Uh, and it, it says, claim victory and one, claim your victories, and then and another thing, celebrate. Yeah, no, it's not here, brother. OK. So th this is a basic concept. And Yvonne Marovic says this all the time, um, which is in, in, you you have to really make a decision about how you frame your action and then you have to follow through with it. Once you decide whatever frame you can't, you can't switch your mind after it. And you also have to own it. So once you you win whatever frame you 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 create, you have to celebrate your victory. You have to claim that victory. You gotta celebrate. And in some ways um, doing that gives you control. So if you do an action scenario, you take over the bridge, even if it's only for five minutes, you take pictures, you say, we did what we said we were going to do, we're victorious, you have a victory party, you tell the press, you issue a press release with the video and the photos of shutting down the bridge, even if it was at the middle of the night and there was no traffic, you still prove that you shut down the bridge. And, that, and then that's all you need to do is claim victory within 
the framework that you talked about. You need to celebrate it. And, and the celebration and claiming victory is part of educating the public and your participants in the victory and making them feel victorious and defending them against the contrary victories, of, um, con contradictory or conflicting theories of change and theories of victory within the movement. So once you do that, your movement then has a, a clear concept that they were victorious, which allows them to be more resilient against the public and the press and against uh, participants that don't think that way. And it creates a common narrative um, and it creates a history of the movement as being victorious. But you can't do that unless you really claim victory after you do it and you celebrate it. Thank Very you, cool. brother. And, um, well, team, we're going to, should we close this up, Belinda? Yeah, are there any readings for this webinar? No, this one, no, no readings for this one. Okay. Uh, but team, we wanted to thank everybody for joining us in this webinar. I know that uh, the concepts that we're talking about here are a little bit more complicated because in a sense it's advanced training. So we're uh, assuming that all of you already understand the information that we produce in our first four webinars. Uh, but we're very excited to even get your feedback. If you're a person that maybe is just watching this on YouTube or online and you have thoughts or comments about, you know, I like this part of the webinar or uh, or this, I have a question about this. Please email the, the please email us on the email that is here on the YouTube page, uh, so we can get that from you. Uh, but now we're taking movement to an open level, and this is why we're even talking about some of this concept. So we want to thank you so much uh, for participating, and we'll have another webinar next week. So see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.